met you yet. I'm married to Chris Ladd, who's the lead pastor here, and we have three very handsome boys. Lifa is 15, Benjamin is 3, and Wyatt is 10 months. And I asked Chris this morning if I could, I had it really on my heart to tell you a story, a very personal story about our journey here at South Point Church. And I'm going to spend just the couple minutes we have this morning telling you about why we're here. right now. He's three years old. He has some special needs. And when those special needs, came, when the, the symptoms started to kick in, our world was rocked. It was hard for us. We stopped going out in public. And we had to make the world very small to protect him and to help him. And we stopped everything we did except for church. We kept coming to church. In South Point Church, you are the church that we call home and the family that we call our you, you loved my child, and you loved me in our mess right as our lives were unraveling. You loved that little boy during the meltdowns when we had to run out of church without making eye contact with anybody. You loved us. And, and because of that, that, we just kept coming. In the middle of all the mess we came, and I have seen that it has spiritually and emotionally done a healing in me to be here with you, and it has done a physiological healing in Benjamin. We're on a lifelong journey, but that boy is worshiping, singing, and dancing with abandon in Wamba Land right now, <laughs> and all week long. And you know what? He loves, when we do go out now, he loves finding someone from church and saying, they go to our church. <laughs> and he, when he's able to, he is so proud when he can brave himself to make the eye contact with someone from church and greet them, despite what his diagnosis says that he can do. And so I want to tell you, keep coming to church. You can bring your dysfunction, you can bring your brokenness, you can bring your sickness and your needs, and you can tell your friends that they can come to whatever stage of life you're in, as life is unraveling or as it's coming back together, whatever it is, whatever happened to you, whatever you've done, this church is a place where you can call home and a family that you can call your own and you will be loved safely and securely just for who you are. But the other good thing I want to tell you is that when you keep coming, and you got to keep coming, there is a money back guarantee if you keep coming. If you do keep coming, you won't stay where you are. If we can see what we have seen in Benjamin and in our family, you will not stay where you are. So keep coming and bring the people that need to come because there's something good for you here. Appreciate it. How are we doing today, church? Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Let me kind of suss you guys out. You know, I'm really quite amazed that Casey got through that because I was backstage and I could hear Wyatt, who's with Brenda, screaming in the passageway somewhere out there. And you know, you guys all know that moms have better ears than dads. They can always hear their babies cry over another baby's cry. So I thought, this, this woman is anointed if she's working through uh, Wyatt screaming in the background. Um, is, not, is Naomi here? It's Naomi. Is it your birthday today? Yeah. So for those of you that will remember, Naomi and her family and her husband Ryan is, is away working on a cruise ship. And we made a commitment as a church that we would stand with them and support them. And today, Naomi turns 23. Yeah. So I want everybody just to make an effort to uh, greet her today and say happy birthday. Let's make sure that she feels, she feels love. So, um, okay, let's get into this message here. I'm excited for this. Uh, I'm always excited for the messages uh, because if I'm not excited about it, then definitely not going to preach very well to you. But this is the last part of a series that we've been doing called Irresistible. And the idea behind the series is that there's lots of things that are irresistible, an irresistible Jesus, an irresistible church, uh, an irresistible love, which is what we're talking about today. But like we covered in the first week, one of the most important things for us to understand and us to grasp as a church is that you, it's you guys, were irresistible or actually are irresistible to God. Now what that means, and we talked about this every week, is that as all the way back to Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve sinned, and God threw Adam and Eve out of the garden for their sin, 
God was still with him. And so if you look at your Bible from cover to cover, really what's happening in that Bible is it is the path of God pursuing his people all the way through. And God will never stop pursuing us. So we're here, this church is here, because you are irresistible to God. That, that, that's the most important thing here. And so we're going to build on that today, and we're going to close this series out. And, and today we're talking about a, a story, um, and I say story, but this is a real event. that was written down, it was recorded. These things actually did happen. So when you read this in the Bible, uh, these are things that went on, that took place, that have eyewitness accounts. We're going to be talking about today a Pharisee with faith and a man with a withered hand. Now, th this may confuse you a little bit because Pharisees were the people that hung Jesus on the cross. But here I'm saying, okay, a Pharisee with faith and a man with a withered hand. Actually, I would even dare to, I'm just going to try and offend you guys, that this Pharisee with faith has more faith in, faith in Jesus than many of you or us have in Jesus, actually. Brenda's wide okay? Fantastic. Now we can go on. So the, the Pharisee has more faith than, than many of us. And then this man with the withered hand. I mean, this is an incredible story. So did you know that there are 37 miracles that Jesus did in the Bible? 37 of them. And when I looked through and I, I found a list of all these miracles in chronological order, my mind or my heart, really, and my spirit just kept being drawn back to this man with the withered hand. And then I was looking at, okay, where is it at? It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not recorded in John. But it's not a lot of verses, so I'm like, is there a lot of meat on the bone there for this? I don't know if this is, you know, it's going to be a seven-minute sermon. Some of you would like that, but, you know, how do I get out? And as I started to study it and look at it, there's actually a, a ton of stuff there. And a lot of amazing things that are there. But before we get to the withered hand, I want to kind of set this up for us so that we understand what Jesus has been dealing with. Because this involves Jesus. And so Jesus and his disciples... At this time in Jesus' ministry, we're starting to really come together and starting to do some miracles and some healings. And they were starting to get some heat from the Pharisees. So the Pharisees were noticing Jesus. And they were already trying to work out a plan for knocking Jesus off his totem pole. For just cutting Jesus down at the knees. They're trying to figure out how on earth they're going to be able to do that. And so before we talk about this story, I want to go back to a Sabbath before and kind of give you guys an introduction of the pettiness that Jesus is up against when it comes to the Pharisees. So, where we pick up in this story here, in Mark 2, what's happening is, is Jesus and his disciples are walking through a wheat field. And as they're walking through this wheat field, they're grabbing the buds of wheat off and they're opening them up and then they're, they're eating them like a, like a snack. And the Pharisees see Jesus and his disciples doing this, and they have a huge problem with it because it's happening on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the day that man was supposed to rest. God even took a Sabbath when he created the world and the universe, and so man's supposed to do that. So one Sabbath, he, as in Jesus, was walking with his disciples through the grain fields as they went along. His disciples, they began picking the heads of grain. Now the Pharisees, they said to him, look, what are they doing? What, th this thing that they're doing is unlawful to do on the Sabbath. So they're saying, Jesus, you and your disciples, you're breaking the law. We have a modern day term for this. <laughs> I don't know if I should say it. Huh? Okay. Today we would call this a Karen. Okay. Now, if your name is Karen, we love you, okay? We... That's why I was like, so blame Alan up here. But we call this, yeah, t so that's what it is. But, but these people are being petty. They're just looking around, looking at something to complain about. And they see them picking heads of grain off. The Pharisees are mad about it. And they say, what you're doing is unlawful. We, the Pharisees, know the law of the Sabbath, so it's unlawful. So now the story goes on in, in the next verse, in verse 25. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures what David did when he was in need and was hungry? So Jesus is quoting now the Old Testament, as we call it today. But to the Pharisees, that was their, their Bible, their book of law. That's where everything came from, was what we would today call the Old Testament. So Jesus is like, hey, remember that guy David that you think is amazing and was the greatest king of Israel and did only good stuff? Well, remember when David was in need and he was hungry and he and his companions, he went into the house of God 
in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and he ate the sacred bread. David and his guys need a snack, and they break into the temple and eat the bread that is set aside for the priests. And so Jesus is like, hey, remember that. Remember when that happened. And so then Jesus goes on to say that, hey, that's not lawful for anyone but the priest to eat. And how? He also gave it to the men who were with him. So David shares this bread. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not the man made for the Sabbath. See, Jesus is trying to get the Pharisees to understand a really important truth here that we're gonna, that's going to really play into our next story. See, the truth behind this is in Leviticus, it actually talks about, it te- Leviticus tells people how to farm their fields. And Leviticus gives instructions that when you farm your fields, when you cut the grain, don't cut all the way to the edge, and also don't be petty and pick up every single little scrap, because the idea was that if you were a homeless person, or you were poor, or you were a traveler that was in need, there would be something on the side of the road for you to go and pick and use. And then in in Deuteronomy, it gets even more specific and says that the act of doing this is not a sin against the Sabbath. What would make it a sin against the Sabbath is if you picked up a blade and you started actually harvesting the grain. So Jesus is like, this is not Leviticus and Deuteronomy. You guys know that you had the, the Pharisees had this stuff memorized. And so he's just kind of throwing it back in their face here. And then Jesus makes this bold statement, the Sabbath was made for man, not the man for the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath was made for us, for our good, for our benefit, and not for you know, the other way around, which has the Pharisees quite upset. So then Jesus, he does this wonderful thing where he says, the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath, and he has authority over it. So let me just draw a quick connection for you here, which I probably don't have time to do, but it's super interesting. David didn't get in trouble for breaking the Sabbath or for breaking the rules and eating the bread because David was the king. He had authority. So Jesus is saying, I, who have even more authority than David ever did, am the one that is not going to get in trouble with breaking the Sabbath because I'm the one that has authority over the Sabbath. I'm the one that established the Sabbath. I'm the one that actually set the rules for it. You guys have just added on to it. I am the authority over the Sabbath. I didn't break the Sabbath because I'm the authority over it. So it's really interesting how Jesus kind of handles that situation. So that happens on a Sabbath. Now, we're going to fast forward. We're going to go to another Sabbath. And we, we're going to see kind of the same players that are going to show up again. And this is where we're going to talk about the man with the withered hand. Now, I want to set the scene for you and talk about the who, when, where, and what. So who was here? The, the scene behind this is you had some really important players. You've got Jesus. You obviously have a man with a withered hand. And you've got the Pharisees. And so you've got those people that are going to have key parts in this story. When did this happen? This happened on a Sabbath day, the day of rest. Where did this happen? This happened in the synagogue. So Jesus goes into the synagogue, into the temple. And that's where this story kind of unfolds. And what happened? What happened ultimately was a man was healed. That, that's what the Pharisees get upset about is that Jesus healed somebody on a Sabbath. He did it. It's like, okay, you guys are being super petty here. But this is what Jesus is dealing with. So I hope that that kind of sets the scene for you. And now we're going to get into the actual story. I'm going to talk you guys through it. But that's the scene. Jesus has already, uh, Jesus ends up doing miracles on the Sabbath. I think he does seven different miracles on the Sabbath. So he's really making a point that he is in authority over the Sabbath. And in fact, this is one the withered hand, Jesus purposefully did it. He could have easily done this the day before or the day after or any other day, but he didn't. He chose to do it on the Sabbath. And so let's get into this story here. We find this, like I said, you can find this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I really focus in on Mark's version. I like it quite a lot. And so we jump into verse 1. Again, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. So Jesus goes into the temple. This happens on temple grounds, the holy of holies, the the most holy place that you could be, the place where all the Pharisees are, the place where all everyone is kind of gathering. It's like a community center. Jesus knew it would be public. He knew there would be a ton of people around. This guy has a plan. He's got intentions for what he's going to do. Then in in verse 2, we go on and it says, 
the Pharisees were watching Jesus closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. There's those Pharisees again. So that they may accuse him in the Jewish high court. So there was a purpose for what the Pharisees were doing. Now here's where I can say that the Pharisees have more faith than many of you have faith. Because see, the Pharisees were lying in wait, and they were waiting on Jesus. They knew that there was a sick man with a withered hand. He was like, he was like bait. He was something that was going to bait Jesus in. So they're watching this guy. And they know that when Jesus walks in, he's going to see him. And they know that he has the ability to heal him. What they don't know is if he will do it or not. But they know that if Jesus chooses to heal this man, he will heal this man. See, the Pharisees believe in Jesus' power, Jesus' authority, the love of Jesus. The Pharisees believed that Jesus had ultimate and just complete compassion for the needy. The Pharisees believed all of that. We struggle with that. We struggle to believe in Jesus, believe in his compassion, to believe in his authority, to believe in his power and his authority over sickness, and to believe in the fact that he can heal us. We struggle with that. But here, the Pharisees, the guys that nailed Jesus to the cross, they didn't struggle with that at all. What they struggled with was that he called himself the Messiah. But they did not doubt his authority, his power, or his ability in this situation to heal so I, I just, when I read this, I thought, I want to have more faith than a Pharisee. You know, I just want to believe more about Jesus than, these, than the Pharisees did. And so if we look at verse 3, the story kind of continues to unfold. He said to the man whose hand was withered, get up and come forth. So Jesus has walked into the temple, walked into the synagogue. The Pharisees are there watching. They're all crouched down. They're like, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? You know? And they're, they're trying to figure it out. And Jesus walks in. He knows the Pharisees are there. You know why? Because he's Jesus. He knows everything. He knows what they're thinking. He knows where they are. He knows what they're looking at. And Jesus says, he walks right in. And he says, hey, you, come over here. Come to me now. Now, this would almost be the equivalent of me looking out here and calling one of you by name. Warren, come on up for a, a, a sermon illustration, you know. And Warren's like, would nuh -uh. you know. It, th this guy, Jesus, basically comes into the temple and says, Hey, come on over here for an illustration about how much I love you and how much I love people. This man was not a part of what Jesus was doing and what the Pharisees were doing. This man was just in the temple to worship God or to pay a sacrifice. Jesus says, Hey, come on over here. Now this man, I can imagine, is walking into a situation where he's got the Pharisees on one side and he's got Jesus on the other side. And this guy's like, you know, I just got up and had breakfast and showed up. I don't want to be in this situation. This is horrible. Because I'm either going to get in trouble with Jesus or I'm going to get in trouble with the Pharisees. But this, I can't see a good way that this is going to work itself out. But he gets up and he comes over and he comes to Jesus. Now, to give you a little bit uh, of information about this man, because this man has what we call a withered hand. Not a withered arm, but a withered hand. And, and the Bible doesn't actually, so this is important that you understand. The Bible does not tell us why his hand was withered. So what I'm going to, the, the description that I'm going to give for his withered hand is not in the Bible. Where we find it is in historians studying the day and age when this man was alive. We find it in archaeological digs. We find it in three medical journals that I read for you. I spent hours reading a medical journal for just to talk about this for two minutes so we're going to talk about this so they believe that this man he had a withered hand okay which meant his hand would have hung down now the name for this is that they're going to put on the screen saturnine neuro neuropathy neuropathy thank you bev draper for helping me with that neuropathy of the right hand now if you look at this first word saturnine what it, what it means is is lead and this second word, neuropathy, means that the, the nerve endings at the ends of the hands or sometimes the feet, but the nerve endings are starting to die. So think about if you're falling asleep on your hand and then you kind of get up and it gets all tingly. Think about that tingle, but even worse and worse and worse. And then eventually all the nerve endings die. And specifically, because I read a journal, we're going to talk about this. It was the radial nerve that wrapped around and impacted the, the hand. Okay. So that, that's, 
that's what they think that this guy had. And the reason that they think he had it is because as they dug up people from this age, they were finding in infant's teeth a high amount of lead poisoning. And so the idea is, okay, this guy probably was born with this or developed it over time because of lead poisoning. So his life is not like in danger to be over. He's not about to die. He, he's, he's just, he's got a drooped hand. It's his right hand, which also means that he couldn't shake someone's hand. It also means that he probably wasn't able to work for himself because he only had one hand. So he probably didn't have a lot of money to his name. So this guy's probably, we can make an assumption that he's poor. We can make an assumption that it's hard to, for him to find a job. We can make an assumption that he dealt with lead poisoning. And maybe that had other impacts and effects on him. And so the, this is the, the man with the withered hand. He, he's dealt a card where he's got maybe lead poisoning, a limp hand. And Jesus calls this guy over. So I wanted you to know more about him, to make him more real to you. Because this, this is a real thing, a real person. This is a real person that was walking around with an infirmary. And he gets called in between Jesus and the Pharisees. With, with a bit of shame, with, with a bit to hide, with this hand. Now, I wonder if he was wearing a, a cloak or something and he kept it hidden or kept it under a shirt. I, I don't know. But he walks up in the middle of, of the Pharisees and Jesus. And then we, we continue with the story here. So he says to the man, get up and come forward. Then Jesus turns and looks at the Pharisees and asks them a question. He asked them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. See, in, in, uh, in Matthew, Jesus is talking about this, and he asked the Pharisees uh, this same question in a different way. He says, if one of you has a sheep that falls down in a hole, will you not go and pick it out? If, if one of you has a, has a horse that, that is lame or an oxen, that, that ends up falling in a hole, would you not drag him out of the mud? Of course you would, because that's your livelihood. Sheep, oxen, that, that you need those things. You would go drag it out of the mud, even on a Sabbath. And then he goes on to say, even those that are working in the temple right now, they're breaking the Sabbath, and that's okay. And what Jesus is trying to establish here is he's trying to establish that, that are, are we not worth more than sheep and oxen? Because you've made allowances for sheep and oxen, but you're saying you're not going to make an allowance for a human life? See, what, what Jesus is asking us to do is to practice mercy before sacrifice. See, mercy means that we're going to show mercy on those that are in need. We're going to show mercy on the man with the withered hand. We're going to show mercy on the hungry traveler that's walking through our fields. We're going to show mercy on those people. And, and then sacrifice, that, that comes later. The sacrifice he's talking about here is sacrificing to the law, sacrificing your Sabbath, sacrificing the things that you shouldn't do. You know what? I'm going to sacrifice the work that I feel like I should do on a Sunday morning or on a Sabbath. I'm going to sacrifice it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to think about it. I'll deal with it on Monday morning. Today is God's day. It's for me and my family. This is the day that God gave me for my betterment. But I'm going to sacrifice everything else. But in the meantime, Jesus is saying, don't forget about mercy. You can help people out. You can love people. You can give them things. It's mercy before sacrifice. This comes out of Hosea. It's a beautiful story of Jesus calling or of God calling a man to pursue a wife who was not, who was not faithful to him. She was a prostitute. And over and over and over again in the book of Hosea, it's mercy before sacrifice. Mercy, 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 mercy. See, mercy is an amazing thing. It's giving you something that you don't deserve. So now we go on in, the, in our story here. Jesus just chewed out the Pharisees. And then in verse 5, see, I'll back up a little bit here in verse 4. See, after Jesus says all this stuff about the sheep and the oxen and all those things and about the temple workers and about mercy, you know, happening before sacrifice... The Pharisees, they, they kept silent. They just didn't say or do anything at all. They just stayed silent. So in verse 5, Jesus is looking around at them. I guess he's waiting on them to say something, and none of them say anything. Now, I imagine them standing in a circle and Jesus being like, and, well, yeah, is it resonating? Are you awake? 
And they say nothing. And when they say nothing, Jesus sees what's in their heart. And that's where verse 5 comes from. After looking around at them with anger, I love when Jesus gets angry. Because it's raw. it shows how raw and real he was. Jesus wasn't just a fairy that floated around and only did good stuff and only smiled. Jesus flipped over tables in the temple. He got mad at things. Jesus is angry at these guys. He's angry and he's grieved, which means his heart is broken for them. Now, the reason that he's angry with them is he's angry at the hardness and the arrogance of their hearts. Jesus is so mad. He's, so, he's like, you guys have an opportunity to follow me. Or even if you don't want to follow me, you have an opportunity to soften your heart and put mercy before sacrifice. But your hearts are so hard because you're so arrogant, because you've created all these laws that revolve around your culture, and you're trying to preserve that over everything else. And here is a human being that we have the potential to heal and to help with mercy. And instead, you're worried about me and what I'm doing. Jesus gets angry at that. He's mad because he's grieved. You know, parents, you could probably identify with this when you see your kids make bad decisions. You get angry because you know that there's better for them. And you know that they are better than that. And you grieve for them. Your heart hurts for them. And so Jesus, as he is our father, he's angry and he's grieved for his children, even the Pharisees. And so now we get to the magic moment here and, and the rest of verse 5, after Jesus has been... You know, his anger has come out. And so Jesus looks at the man, the withered hand, and he says, hold out your hand. And the man held it out, and his hand was completely restored. That's the miracle. So he just tells the man, hold out your hand. The man holds out his hand. It's restored. Didn't touch it, didn't mess with it. He just told him to do it. The man held it out, and he did it. And so then what the Pharisees did... In verse 6 here is the Pharisees, they went out immediately and they began conspiring with the Herodians to plot against him as to how they might fabricate some legal grounds to put him to death. So the Pharisees weren't like, wow, that's amazing, that's cool, maybe I'll reconsider this thing. Instead what they did is they found another group of Jewish people that weren't Pharisees called the Herodians that they, they were dedicated to the king and the Pharisees and them hated each other. But they could unify around one thing, and the thing that they could unify around was the idea that they hated Jesus even more. And so they started plotting, which would ultimately get Jesus put on the cross. And so here we have the end of our story where they walk out. But that's not where this message starts or ends for you guys. See, the, the rest of today's sermon is going to be for those of you who want Jesus. That's what, if from this point forward, this message is directed for those of you that want Jesus. You may be curious about him. You may have him knocking on your heart. You've never opened the door. You may be a Christian for, for your whole life. This is for those of you that want Jesus. And the first thing that we can kind of look at when it comes to this miracle of Jesus healing the man's hand is, is that we're going to look at the person who the command was given to. So the, the command was given to the man with the withered hand. Then Jesus said to the man, hold out your hand. This, this command was given to him. Now see, Jesus doesn't say, hold out your, your arm, or he doesn't say, lift up your elbow or lift up your shoulder. He says specifically, hold out your hand. Now this is important because Jesus is directly commanding this man to do the one and only thing that he could not do. See, if he said Jesus, if, he, if Jesus said, hey, man, raise your elbow, and he raised his elbow, and then he said, your hand's healed, and then it was healed. No. Jesus said, raise the one thing in you that's broken. Raise your infirmary. Raise the thing that doesn't work. Do the thing that you can't do. He said, raise that hand, and the man raised his hand, and he was healed. See, what this does for us is this paints a beautiful picture of actually the gospel message for us. That, 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 to me, is what this represents. See, the one thing that we can't do is we can't get ourselves right between us and God. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how amazing you do. It doesn't matter how much money you give to the church. It doesn't matter how charitable you are. And it also doesn't matter how sinful you are. It doesn't matter what you've done wrong. There is nothing that we can do that brings us in right standing with God. See, but the gospel message is this amazing message that does it for us. See, the command which 
brought healing with it was addressed to the one who was utterly incapable. There's another command for you that will bring healing with it. And it's addressed to you who are utterly incapable of doing it on your own. That's the gospel. Now, what does the gospel say? It says, believe in me and be saved. See, Jesus, that's the one thing that Jesus does that we can't do. Jesus fills the gap and he brings us into right standing with God. Nothing you, ever, nothing you will ever do will do that. That's just Jesus. So Jesus uses this man to show that, and then the gospel does the same thing for us. See, we are all incapable of doing this thing. But the sad thing is, is that only some of us are willing. See, that this is what broke Jesus' heart and made him angry at the Pharisees. We're all incapable. Therefore, because we're incapable, we are worthy of receiving the miracle. But just because you're worthy of receiving the miracle that Jesus has for you, it doesn't mean that you're willing. So you got to ask yourself, am I willing? The Pharisees, that's a picture of not being willing. The man raising his hand, when this man knew he couldn't fill his hand, he knew he couldn't use his hand, he was asked to do something impossible, but he was willing. And because he was willing, this miracle, this miracle happened. So... What I would like for you guys to think about doing is, I would like for you guys to willingly bring your withered hands to Jesus today. Whatever this is for you, I don't know what your withered hand is. Maybe it's the simple fact that your soul is not in right standing with God. I have good news for you. That's the easiest thing that you can do to get right. That's easier than getting your finances right. That's easier than fixing your car. That's easier than mending relationships with your family. That's easier than anything else that you have going on in your life right now. The easiest thing that you could choose to do in life, period, is accept the gift of the gospel and be healed. All you have to do is be willing. See, the only way you can accept that is because of Jesus. Jesus asks you to do something you're incapable of doing. If you're willing, Jesus will do it for you. That's the gospel message. It's simple. And it's for all of us. Now, we can also look at, the second person I want to look at is the person that gives the command. See, then Jesus, see, before it was the man. So now then Jesus said to the man, hold out your right hand. See, what's incredible about this is Jesus was not uh, flashy. He didn't say, hey, I want you to spin around seven times, duck down twice, uh, find a purple pigeon, tap it on the back. And then your hand will be healed. Now, Jesus just directly said, hey, raise up your hand and your hand will be healed. The thing about Jesus is he goes directly to the source. He goes directly to the heart. He goes directly to the need. He doesn't waste time. He doesn't mess around. He goes, go, he goes right to your heart. And someone in this room right now, Jesus is pounding at your heart right now. He doesn't care about your finances or your sin or your infidelity or anything else that's going on in your life, your addictions. He doesn't care. What he cares about is you and your heart. And he's going directly there and saying, accept my gospel message. Believe in me. Be willing and you will be saved. See, the, the amazing thing about Jesus is that he is able to give power to do what he has commanded you to do. So if Jesus commands the man to raise his hand, he has the power to heal the hand. If Jesus commands us to accept the gospel message, then he has the power to change you and heal you. Whatever your withered hand is in your life, your heart, your soul, Jesus is saying, raise it and I'll heal it. I'll take care of it. And I have the power to do it. See, Jesus gives that guarantee. Casey was talking about a money back guarantee. We're never going to give you money back, by the way. <laughs> but this is a guarantee that, that, I, that I and our finance team can get behind here. It, it's that if he... If he asks you to do it, he has the power to see it through. So what you have to do is, is you've got to put yourself in a situation where you stop believing in you and you start believing in him. You've got to let go of yourself. You've got to let go of the idea that, no, I can turn this around. you also got to let go of the idea, I'll never turn this around because I'm so horrible and miserable. you just got to let go of all that. You've got to stop believing in yourself and start believing in him. Because again, believing in Him, what is that? 
the gospel message. If you are willing and you believe that Jesus came for you, you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's done. That's it. It's over. Your life is made right in the eyes of God. You stop believing in you, you believe in Him. Jesus is going to heal whatever that withered hand is in your life. Now the last thing that we'll look at before we kind of close this message down here is we're going to look at the, the command itself. So then Jesus said to the man, gave him a command, hold out your hand. Now this command, as I said before, was, was direct. This command went directly to the needs of that, of that man. Went directly to his need. And, and I don't want us to, to kind of confuse this story into thinking that, well, all Jesus did was heal a withered hand. What about like the cool stories where he raises a guy from the dead or where he turns water into wine? Hey, that's a great one. Jesus' first miracle Jesus ever did was got everybody drunk. Jesus made good wine. See, the, the, the story, kind of a tangent there on that is Jesus' intention was not to get everybody drunk, but what would happen in a party is that they would serve the good wine first, and then as people got a little bit inebriated, then they would start serving cheap wine because people wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And so when they run out of wine, Jesus turns water into wine, but he turns it into the best wine that anyone has ever tasted. So that, that, that's what Jesus does there. But Jesus' command to this guy was direct. But Jesus was asking this man one thing and one thing only. Do the very thing that you can't do. Raise your hand. See, so, so I would make an appeal to you, and I've told you this so many times before. My heart is bothered and broken for those of you that are not in right standing with Jesus. You know what that means? That means that you have, here's what it means in simple, in simple terms. That means that you have a bad day. And you don't have a heavenly father to love you through a bad day. That means that you have problems in your marriage. You have a spouse that makes you feel bad. You, you, have, you, have, you have a marriage that's being torn apart by the world. And you don't have a heavenly father to knit you guys back together. That means that you're stressed out with anxiety and depression and you're just, you can't handle yourself. You're yelling at your kids or your family or you're a young single person and you're sitting alone in your, in your apartment or your house and you're thinking, man, nothing is ever going to come for me. I'm going to stay single the rest of my life. And you don't have Jesus to turn to in that moment? That's horrible. See, I believe that I can have more faith than the Pharisees. I believe that I can have more faith in who Jesus said he was than the Pharisees. So that means that as your pastor, my heart breaks. It utterly hurts for those of you that are in here and for those that are not in here but out there in the city that don't know Jesus. It hurts my heart. Not because they're wrong and we're right and we need to get them off their team and get them on my team. It's not about that. It's about a whole bunch of withered hands walking around with withered hands, withered hearts, and withered souls. And it's just so easy for them to accept the gospel message and say, okay, the one thing you're asking me to do is the thing I can't do? That's okay, I'll be willing. I'll raise my hand and watch Jesus heal it. All you have to do is be willing. Even though you feel like it's the very thing you can't do, that's why it's the thing that you need to be willing to do. Because Jesus and his promise is behind it. See, the gospel message is our direct command. Believe and you shall be saved. Believe and you shall be saved. See, an irresistible love is what fueled this magic moment. This magic moment between the, the, the guy with the withered hand and Jesus. You know, as we finish this message, we're talking about irresistible church, irresistible Jesus. You are irresistible to God. And today we're talking about irresistible love. Why would Jesus make it so easy for you to have a relationship with him if his love was not irresistible, if you were not irresistible to him? See, Jesus' love is so irresistible that this man walks over and he chooses Jesus, chooses to have faith in Jesus. See, he has a decision to make, just like you guys do. You've got the bar on one side, and you've got your home on the other side. 
you've got an open browser tab on one side and you've got your wife in another room on the other side. You've got your sin, your brokenness, your sadness, your loneliness. On the other side, you have a heavenly father that wants to take you in and take care of you. See, there's nothing that you have to do but believe in the Lord as your savior. Jesus will heal your withered hand. So today, what I would ask you to do is I would ask you to stretch out your hand and I would ask you to break away from that which keeps you withered. Today is the day that you get an opportunity to let it go. And I'm going to give you guys that opportunity. Why? Because you are irresistible to God. And so I'm about to pray. And when I pray, we're going to have our, our prayer partners um, come down forward. In fact, if you're one of our prayer partners, go ahead and come on down and fill the, the wings here on the side. These are people that we've hand-selected, people we love, people we trust, people that are, are not scary or mean, but wonderful, wonderful people. And today's your day where you're going to stretch out your withered hand and you're going to do the thing that you're incapable of doing. That's all you have to do is be willing. And right now what I'm going to give you an opportunity to do is think about that thing in your life that has you withered. And when we go into this worship song, I'm going to ask you to stretch out your hand, do the thing that you don't feel like you can do, and get up and go see one of our prayer partners. You're going to tell them what has you withered. They're going to pray with you, and they're going to help you make sure that you've got the gospel message right in your life. Now, I thought of a hundred ways to soften this. A hundred different ways to, to, to kind of break it down differently and say, hey, you know what, in your seats, just pray. And if you need us, email us or call us. And I was reading a commentary about this. And specifically what Jesus is talking about in this verse is don't go home and pray. Don't go learn the Bible. Don't go do a whole bunch of other things. Don't get counseling for your sin and then come to me. What Jesus is saying, no. You only do what you're incapable of doing. You're all capable of going home and studying the Bible. You're all capable of going home and getting a counselor and dealing with your problems. You're all capable of going and apologizing to that family member. You are all capable of, of the ability to stop your addictions, to break free from anxiety and depression. You're all capable of that. The one thing that you're not capable of doing is getting yourself in right standing with God. And Jesus says, don't do any of that other stuff yet. Do the one thing first raise your withered hand and so I thought you know we, we often do not do things in such a direct way because we love you we want this environment to be safe we want this environment to be a safe place for all of you for anybody no matter where they are in their walk or whether they're new or it's their hundredth time we want this to be safe but I'm telling you today that God put this on my heart for a reason and if there's just one person in here that needs to get that right, then it was worth it. Even if no one comes up, I don't care because I've done my part. Jesus told me the message to give. Just like he couldn't make the Pharisees change their hearts, I can't make you get up. But all I can do is say that there's a bunch of withered hands and such a simple gospel that's there for you. Just accept it. It's the one thing you can't do is save yourself accept that gospel message so when I start to pray the band's gonna come out and they're just gonna play um, a, a song a response song and listen if that's you if you've got a, a withering in you somewhere I just as soon as everyone stands up to worship just move move and come down front grab a prayer partner and talk to them just move immediately just move and if you don't move I'm gonna pray that God just gives you an itch in your shoe or he just messes with you or something. I'm going to pray that God just messes with you so that you, you have to move. And then we're going to sing this song and after we close out the service and we sing the song, our prayer partners are going to stick around afterwards because I know that this is hard, it's scary, and there is no condemnation in this place. There's only conviction. Conviction draws you near to God. Condemnation separates you from God. So if you find that you can't do it and you sit in the service and everyone leaves, these prayer partners are still going to be here. Because I don't care if you're, it's, it's not my job to make you obedient. But what I can do is I can leave these guys up here for a while. So that if it takes you longer, 
they're still here for you. Let's get our gospel message right today. Jesus says that I will heal you if you are willing.